All right, welcome back everybody to week 13. Uh, this week we're covering early members of the human lineage, chapter 15 in your textbook. And so what we're looking at this week is the first species that branch off in the greater primate family tree um, into the branch that we are the, the modern tip of. So our ancestors, the first species that are evolving into something like a human being. And so we'll cover the, the first phase of that this week, and then next week we'll look at the later members of the human lineage, so the species that connect this week's material to us today. There we go. So our learning objectives for this week. Be familiar with the various species of Australopithecine, and we'll get into what Australopithecines are in a moment, what the traits of those species are, and the order in which they appeared. Understand the distinction between gracile and robust Australopithecines, and the distinction between Australopithecines and the genus Homo. Be familiar with the first species in genus Homo, so we'll cover this week all the way up to the appearance of genus Homo and the first species in that genus. And we're going to look a little bit at stone tools, so we're moving from paleontology to archaeology. So be familiar with the form of the very first stone tools, and we'll talk a little bit about what the appearance of complex stone tools means for understanding the evolution of human cognition. couple of notes on how this material is going to be presented. First of all, throughout this presentation, you're going to see the abbreviation MYA, and that just stands for millions of years ago. So everything that we're going to talk about today happened millions of years ago, and instead of spelling out millions of years ago every time on the slide, we just write MYA. And although you won't see it this week, we also use KYA to mean thousands of years ago, and we'll start seeing thousands of years ago next week. Although we've looked a a lot at skeletal material. Most of the stuff we look at this week and next will be craniums. And the reason for that is because craniums preserve well in the archeological record. So we find a lot of craniums. And as we've seen, craniums have a lot of features on them. And so differences in craniums allow us to distinguish different species from each other. And this also means that historically in the study of, uh, of human ancestors, cranial capacity has gotten a lot of attention. It's used as a proxy for intelligence. Cranial capacity implies brain size. Brain size implies something about intelligence, although it's not absolute. And so when you look at these species, one of the traits we always look at is what is their cranial capacity. And then a couple of notes. This is a really rapidly changing area of research. So something new is always being found. Um, there are always publications coming out that change the story. The textbook is out of date, even the new textbook, if you have the new one. And I can guarantee you that by the end of 2020, uh, something that I tell you today will be wrong, or at least a theory will have been published explaining why it's probably wrong. So don't take this as the gospel. Uh, if you are interested in this area, keep reading, watch the news, look up science news sources, um, and you'll constantly see uh, new ideas coming out and new finds. And finally, we're going to be talking about a variety of species, and the designation of different species is kind of a hot topic in paleoanthropology. There's a, this idea of lumping versus splitting in taxonomy. Lumping is when you tend to group similar specimens together and argue that they're probably all one species, and splitting is when you use fine distinctions between individuals to argue that they're different species. And in paleontology, uh, this is something that happens a lot because, among other things, discovering a new species is really good for your career, right? Discovering specimen number 400 of an existing species is not so great for your career, nothing special. And so there's a real lot of pressure to when you find a cranium with an unusual variation, um, determine that it is a new species. Personally, I tend to be a lumper. I don't have much skin in the game as far as discovering new species goes. And so with what I will present this is from a lumper point of view, you will find some more discussion in the textbook. And if you look at other sources online, um, arguing that some of these species are more distinct and can be split up more ways. I don't think that really makes much sense for an intro level course, so I'm going to present you with 
the basic material. And again, if you find it interesting, you can dive into it and look at the arguments about whether different species uh, have more variation to them uh, than I'm going to present it here. Okay, so let's begin with the pre-Australopithecines. So, right, there has to be some point where a primate evolved into something that was our first ancestor, right? Kind of a chicken and egg problem. And we don't know exactly where that is, but we know that it probably lies somewhere in this group of pre-Australopithecine species. So here we're looking for the first member of the hominin lineage. And what we tend to see in these species is that they have a mix of adaptations for bipedalism and arboreal locomotion, as we've covered in the past couple of weeks. All of these species were probably habitual bipeds because we're bipeds. And so somewhere in our ancestry, there was a habitual biped that eventually became an obligate biped. But we also know that they lived in forested environments because the geological layers that we find them in have fossilized remains of forests. And so this also then challenges the savannah hypothesis, thinking back to last week, right? We see that bipedalism evolved in a forested environment and not necessarily as part of pressure to walk out onto the savannah. And to give you an idea of how difficult determining some of this is, on the right here, these are all the bones that were used to make the species designation of one of the pre-Australopithecines uh, that we're going to talk about, Aurora tugenensis. And as you can see, it's not much, right? The main thing that they have here is they have the heads of both femurs. And from that, we can tell a lot, as we looked at last week, right? So the angle of the femur uh, relative to the head it can tell you something about bipedalism, the arrangement of the head of the femur, the way it's shaped, I can tell you something about bipedalism, but it's not a whole lot of information. And F and G are fragments of the mandible, which were used to try to say something about diet. And since then, more pieces of this species have been found, but I just wanted to drive home the point that these designations are often made on very limited evidence um, because we're just trying to figure out anything that we possibly can about these species. And that's why they're so subject to change, because if you find a new specimen, right, if we found a cranium of Roran tugenensis, that would allow us to prove or disprove many of the theories that have been developed about it. So we need to know two pre-Australopithecines. The first one is Sahelanthropus chedensis, and that just means uh, primate, ape, anthropus from the Sahel, which is a region in Africa in Chad, which is a country in Africa. So nothing complicated there. The name is virtually impossible even for me to say, um, but just means the ape from the Chadian Sahel. And uh, this species lived between seven and six million years ago. And all we have from this species are craniums. There's an example on the right there. You can see the extremely prominent brow ridge. And the most important thing about this species is that their foramen magnum is positioned more towards the back of the skull. So relative to earlier primates, which, as you remember, were more like squirrels or tree shrews, right? We're seeing the foramen magnum move from the very back of the skull towards underneath the skull. It's not nearly as underneath as it is in, say, chimpanzees, but it's moving down. And so this suggests that Sahelanthropus had a somewhat upright posture and maybe some degree of bip bipedalism. They have very small cranial capacity, uh, more like the size of a chimpanzee, and as I said, that large brow ridge. And so we, this might have been a human ancestor, right? It might be the first pre-Australopithecine, but it might also be the first chimpanzee ancestor. We're not entirely sure. So we're at here we're at a point far back enough in time, at 7 million years ago, where we're not even sure yet exactly if the chimpanzees have split off from us yet. And then the other specimen you need to know is Aurora tugenensis from the previous slide. Uh, these guys lived about 6 million years ago, and in contrast to Sahelanthropus, we don't have any craniums. All we have are femurs and mandibles and some other small pieces. But we do know they have that angled femur, which, as we saw last week, indicates some bipedal locomotion. And their teeth are more similar to non-human apes. So if you think back to diet, right, our diet is very generalized. The diet of many non-human apes is more specific, focusing often on fruit or leaves. 
And so from that dentition, and we don't have the cranium, but we do have teeth because teeth survive really well, um, we can tell that maybe they, again, were not behaving very much like humans. They were behaving more like, say, a monkey. And so we're going to see this trend a lot as we go through the various species, that often the cranium and the postcranium, that is everything below the head, tell us different things, and that if we only find a cranium, it gives us a very different picture than if we only find the postcranial remains, and that if we have the postcranium and the cranium together, they often present a very interesting picture, and we'll see that in an upcoming example here. Okay, then we have what is most definitely a human ancestor, uh, and this is Artipithecus ramidus. This is also a pre-Australopithecine. And as you can see on the right there, we have a relatively complete skeletal record of Artipithecus ramidus. Not much of the, of the uh, central torso remains, but we have all the limbs, and the limbs tell us a lot, and we have a cranium that is associated with those limbs. So Artipithecus ramidus dates to about 4.4 million years ago, and they have a mix of bipedal and arboreal traits for locomotion. So on the one hand, you can see on the feet there in the picture, they have a grasping divergent hallux, just like a chimpanzee, which implies uh, arboreal adaptation, right? They need to be able to grip trees that they're sitting in. But the rest of the toes are short like us, and that's an adaptation for bipedalism. They have long arms and fingers, again, like a chimpanzee, and that's an arboreal adaptation, but they have a relatively short, wide pelvis, which is a bipedal adaptation. So here we're seeing, and this is really common, remember this is mosaic evolution, we're seeing a mix of traits between arboreal adaptations and bipedal adaptations, telling us that these species were probably habitual bipeds that still spent a lot of their time in the trees. And their cranial capacity is similar to that of a chimpanzee, but much smaller than an australopithecine. So in, in australopithecines, we'll see the first big jump to uh, the process of increasing cranial capacity. Okay, so then we get into the next class, uh, and that is australopithecines. And then we're, we're going to cover a wide variety of species that existed between four and one million years ago, when genus Homo starts to appear. And the big marker of the Australopithecines is that they're generally ape-like, but they have large and increasing over time cranial capacities, and they're definitely bipedal. And we see that from their adaptations. They're habitual bipeds. There are, as far as we know, no obligate biped Australopithecines. All of these species have some mix of arboreal and bipedal adaptations, but the arboreal adaptations become less and less as we get closer and closer to genus Homo, and the bipedal adaptations become more and more prominent. And we think with quite a bit of certainty that these are our ancestors. The Australopithecines are a direct evolutionary line to genus Homo, and we'll see how those traits appear over time. As far as how they lived, we think based on their body size, which is relatively small, and the fact that in some examples they use tools, which we'll get, get into more, that they were basically foraging and scavenging. So they didn't have the kind of organized society that we would imagine for hunter-gatherers, so they weren't organizing into groups, taking their tools, and going out and hunting buffalo or gathering food into baskets. They were probably just moving from patch to patch and exploiting whatever food resources they could. And we see that behavior in some primates. So for instance, baboons will scavenge kills on the savanna. Um, they're sort of at the bottom of the totem pole. So after the lions come the hyenas and after the hyenas come some other carnivores, or scavengers. And after that, sometimes the baboons can sneak in and steal some meat. And we think that's the model for Australopithecine um, subsistence. And we also find Australopithecine individuals that have marks on them, especially on the cranium, that indicate that they were killed by large predators. So for instance, we have Australopithecines that have saber-toothed tiger fang holes through the backs of their head. Right? So they were living in an environment with very large predators, and they were often preyed upon themselves. They weren't exactly masters of their environment. 
So as I said before, there's really no debate uh, anymore scientifically about whether or not these are our ancestors. It's, the evolutionary link is pretty clear. And all of the fossils that we're going to talk about are found in the eastern half of Africa, uh, mostly in Kenya, Ethiopia, and Tanzania, so sort of northeast sub-Saharan Africa. Some fossils are found in South Africa uh, in a couple of cases, and not much in the space in between them. And this will be important next week when we try to look at how humans spread across the entire world, as we are today, um, because it tells us something about where the origin point for all those individuals must have been, somewhere in Africa, since that's where all uh, ancestral humans evolved. Another thing to think about is that doing paleontology in Africa is not always the easiest thing between the difficulty of access in the environment and the difficulty of access for political and social reasons. And so there are large areas, for instance, in Mozambique, which is between Tanzania and South Africa, where no early fossils have been found. It's also had a civil war going on for most of the last 50 years since independence. It's an extremely dangerous place. So part of our data set has some bias to it in that it's only data that can be acquired from places that you can actually get to and do research. And one of the, one of the ways that we get significant updates to this information, that I'm, as I mentioned in the first slide, are when new areas are opened up that can be worked in. So for instance, Chad was not a very easy area to work for a long time. And then once people were able to work there, they found Sahianthropus, Chadensis. And we can expect that process hopefully to continue as well. Um, Australopithecines in general existed between four and one million years ago. But over that at time, different species evolved and went extinct. And we'll look at uh, that timeline at the end. And one of the important things you need to know is that they can be divided into two groups based mainly on cranial differences, uh, the gracile group and the robust group. And that's mostly based on differences in the mandible and face. Gracile australopithecines have a smaller, more delicate face, and robust australopithecines have a larger, thicker face, as you can see on the right there. And those differences are based mainly on adaptations for diet. And we'll look at that as we look at each species. So just as an example, here are some craniums from gracile australopithecines. Note that the face is relatively narrow, and they do have large cheek flares and brow ridges and large mandibles. But now compare that to the robust australopithecines on the next slide. These are robust australopithecines. They have much larger mandibles, and they have much larger cheek flares and brow ridges. And we'll look at some individual examples here. OK. Grassile australopithecines, generally speaking, are similar to chimpanzees in terms of their body size. So they're much smaller than we are and their cranial shape, but not their cranial size. So they have bigger craniums, but the shape of the cranium is similar to a chimpanzee, which means that it has a relatively large flat face, large brow ridges, and behind the brow ridges, a relatively small uh, cranium. And there are lots of species in the grass owl classification. We're only going to focus on three that you need to know, and those are Australopithecus afarensis, Australopithecus africanus, and Australopith Australopithecus garhi. And as we looked at before, once you have a species, you can shorthand it by just writing the genus as A. So that is totally acceptable on homework and exams. You don't need to write Australopithecus every single time. You can just write A afarensis, A africanus, and so on. And of course, A afarensis and A africanus sound very similar, and even I might get them mixed up. So just make sure when you're answering a question that you have the right one know the difference between them. And we're going to look at a lot of reconstructions because obviously all we have are limited physical remains. So just keep in mind that the, the artist's reconstructions are works of art. They're interpretive. They're not guaranteed to be completely accurate. We just want to give you some idea of what these species might have looked like. And reconstruction is kind of a tricky task. Um, so again, don't take these as 100% the truth about how things looked. Take them as ideas to think about. 
Okay, the first species we're going to look at, and probably one of the most important ones for understanding human evolution, is Australopithecus afarensis. Uh, this species existed between 3.6 and 3 million years ago, and the biggest characteristic we identify them by is the fact that they have a very prognathic face. And so prognathic means projecting. Prognathism is the... The, the, the state of being of projecting and their face is much more prognathic than modern humans. So our face is very flat and the faces of these individuals, as you can see in both the reconstruction and skull, stuck out quite a bit, especially in the mouth area, but it is flatter than chimpanzees. So chimpanzees, their muzzle sticks out even further than ours. They have a very small cranial capacity, 350 to 500 cubic centimeters, and we'll abbreviate cubic centimeters as CC. From here on out, if you drive a motorcycle, you're familiar with that. And their brain size, therefore, is comparable to a chimpanzee's. So we take that as a proxy for intelligence. Of course, it's not absolute, but we assume that their mental capacity was, again, similar to a chimpanzee's. And remember, chimpanzees are smart. They can do a lot of things, but they lack some of the mental processes that humans have. They're not good at long-term planning. They don't have extremely sharp memory. And a lot of the things that they don't do, that we do, take place in the frontal lobe. And what you'll see in a lot of these craniums is that the frontal lobe is extremely constricted. So think about our skull. You can even, it's a good time to touch your skull and look at the skull on the picture, right? Their skull constricts quite a bit behind their brow ridges. And of course, our skull in the front is massively inflated and sits over our brow ridges, which barely exist. And this is where most of the cranial growth happens over time. So at the back of the skull, there are certain, at the back of the brain, there are certain important processes that are common to all animals. And at the front of the brain is a lot of the things that kind of distinguish us as humans. And so we'll see look at the skulls and see how the front of the cranium sort of inflates rapidly as cranial capacity starts to go up. Uh, afarensis had very large molars and premolars, uh, and they have that 2, 1, 2, 3 dental pattern that establishes all the great apes, which they're also a part of. And they had relatively generalized dentition. So they have, you can see there, relatively large incisors and canines and along with those large molars, and that tells us that they ate a wide variety of foods, as chimpanzees do and as we do, and that stands in contrast to robust australopithecines, who ate mostly plants. We'll look at their adaptations in a little bit here. And we know from a relatively complete skeletal record that Australopithecus afarensis was a habitual biped. They have some arboreal adaptations. Most importantly, they have long arms relative to their legs. But they have a large number of adaptations that are important for bipedalism. They have the angled femur, and they have a short, broad pelvis. Not as short and broad as we do, not as bull-shaped, but quite a bit more so than earlier primates. They also appear to have had relatively high sexual dimorphism. So the difference in body size between males and females is similar to that in chimpanzees or in gorillas. And that leads us to believe that they had probably a polygonous social structure, the happy couple in this picture notwithstanding. And a lot of our data for uh, afarensis comes from this skeleton, Lucy, which you might have heard of. It's relatively famous. It's the first example of afarensis that was ever found in 1974, and it's also one of the most complete ones. So we have about 40% of an individual skeleton, and you can see that the sacrum, especially, and the pelvis are relatively complete. We have most of one femur, although it's broken into segments. And we have most of the arm bones and a lot of intact vertebrae. And this is relatively unusual, especially to find things like the vertebrae and ribs, which disintegrate pretty easily. And so that gave us a lot of the information that we have. Since then, many other samples of afarensis have been found, um, but none of them have been as complete as this one. We have more craniums which tells us more about things like diet. But this is a good example of, if this is the most complete skeleton we have found, you can imagine that many of our other species are much less complete, and we have to make a lot of interpretations based on the limited data that we have found.
Lucy was named that because from the shape of the pelvis, she was determined to be probably female. And she was about 3.5 feet tall. So these are, again, relatively small, more like a chimpanzee size, just a chimpanzee standing upright to so stretch out a little bit. But if you, they were around us, they would be clearly recognizable as some other species. So one of my kind of shorthand criteria for looking at these species is, would they, if you put them in a suit, could they pass as an extremely weird looking human or would they clearly be something different? And at this point, uh, afarensis would clearly be something different, right? Because they're so small. And the finding of this complete skeleton then showed us that you could have a species with an ape-like cranium and bipedalism. Before that, there was this idea that the first bipedal species was something quite close to genus Homo already, that bipedalism and intelligence probably evolved hand in hand. And Lucy showed us that that's not true, that there were uh, species that were very bipedal, um, but had basically the head of an ape, and that bipedalism was evolving all by itself a long time before cognitive ability started to increase, possibly millions of years before it started to increase. All right, the next species we're going to look at is Australopithecus africanus. They're very similar to Australopithecus afarensis. They, their time span is a little later, three to two million years ago. And again, this is an individual that has a very ape-like cranium, see the reconstruction, while the postcranium has a lot of bipedal traits. Their cranial capacity is slightly larger. That's the main thing you need to know. Their cranial capacity is a little larger than Africanus, 450 to 550 cubic centimeters. And the big deal with Africanus is that for a long time, it was our focus of study because although it lived later than Afarensis, it was discovered about 50 years earlier. And so for most of the 20th century, most of our research into the evolution of human origins focused on samples of Africanus. Um, and it wasn't until we found Afarensis that we started to understand that um, this combination of ape-like cranium and, and uh, human-like postcranium went back much further in time. So we're not going to look at any deep details about Africanus. You just need to know that it's the transitional species between Afarensis and Garhi, which we're going to look at next. All right, and so this is Australopithecus Garhi. Uh, they existed, as far as we know, for a relatively short time in East Africa between uh, around two and a half million years ago. Again, their cranial capacity is relatively small, around 450 cubic centimeters. Note again, the narrow postcranial, uh, or sorry, uh, post-orbital constriction, which means they had a very small frontal lobe. And notably, they had much longer legs than Africanus and Afarensis. So we see it there for a species that is using their habitual bipedalism more and using their arboreal adaptations less. And that could either mean that they're simply moving down out of the trees or that they're moving out of the forest onto the savanna in line with the, the savanna hypothesis. And the big deal with Australopithecus garhi is that there are remains of this species associated with stone tools. And until this was found, we thought that Homo habilis uh, and genus Homo in general was the only genus able to make stone tools. But this finding shows us that tool making behavior might date as far back as the latest Australopithecines. And the tool, the type of tool that they're associated with is something called Oldowan technology. It just means that they were found in Olduvai Gorge. And so Oldowan is the adjective for something from, Old, from Olduvai. And uh, it's a very simple tool technology that, again, was originally associated with, with Homo habilis. And it's the earliest tool technology that we're aware of and have designated. And so as we look at genus Homo next week, we'll look at subsequent tool technologies. So if you make flashcards or make a, a study guide, one thing you'll definitely want to have is a list of tool technologies and their characteristics uh, in chronological order. And so that will start with Oldowan tools. So Oldowan tools are extremely simple. We'll look at some in the next couple of slides. They consist largely of something called a chopper and flakes. 
And a chopper is just a rock that has been uh, napped or struck so that a few flakes come off and create a sharp edge. And the flakes themselves are sharp, and they can also be used as tools. So basically you have sort of a, uh, a small axe and a bunch of small knives in modern terms. So here's how you make an old one tool. You take a rock of the appropriate shape, you take another rock that's kind of round and hard, and you just angle the, the first rock and you whack it uh, carefully so that the edge breaks off the rock and exposes a sharp surface. And so this is showing here that you make multiple whacks. So you take off the first flake, then the second flake, then the third flake, and it will make this kind of scalloped edge. And that edge is sharp, and you can use it to slice or, or cut things. And then you get the flakes as well, and the flakes are sharp, and they often have a point to them. And you can use those sharp edges and those points, again, to process various materials. And so one thing this is really good for is if you find a dead antelope that has partially been eaten by lions at, and you want to grab some meat and get out of there before the lions come back, if you have a sharp rock, it's much easier to chop some of that meat off, grab it, and run away before the lions come back. And this is the kind of thing you get. And you might ask yourself, it looks like just a bunch of rocks. And while well, there's a whole specialization uh, that looks for certain details in these rocks and differentiates them from just busted rocks. So up here we have, these are choppers, right? So here you can maybe see there's a sharp edge here and a sharp edge here. They can be used to chop stuff. On this example, this has been sharpened so that there's a sharp edge here, right? This one is a sharp edge here. And then these are all flakes, and they could have been used in various ways. This is a great example here. You can see the smooth is the interior surface of the rock where it was struck off, and that smooth break leaves this nice sharp edge that can be used to scrape stuff. Again, one of the things this might have been used for is like breaking bones open to get the marrow inside, which is highly nutritious, or getting the last bits of meat off that are hard to reach with your, with your tongue and your teeth. Right? Think about it when you're eating chicken wings. If you use a knife or even just a little piece of a little blade to get some of the last bits out, you will get some extra nutrition from that. And so they look simple and they are relatively simple. It doesn't take a ton of skill to make old one tools. Um, and that's okay because these species had relatively limited cognitive capacity. But we first see them with Australopithecus garhi, and that's a big step, right? The step from just using whatever rock you find in the environment to taking a specific rock, taking another rock, whacking them together in a certain way so that you get a certain edge on it, and then picking up the extra pieces and thinking, hmm, I could use this for something too. That's a huge leap mentally from what a chimpanzee can do. And so that's an important uh, step in evolution. All right, then we're going to look at a couple of the robust Australopithecines. And for a long time, ro the robust Australopithecines were designated as a separate genus altogether, Paranthropus. In the process of lumping and splitting, there's an argument that's been made that they are actually just Australopithecines and they shouldn't be distinguished with their own genus. And I happen to agree with that, and the textbook agrees with that as well. So we're going to look at them as Australopithecines, but you will see the same species names associated with genus Paranthropus in other sources. And I think the book shows both and then talks about Australopithecines. But if you Google, for instance, Paranthropus Ethiopicus, you will find the information that I'm about to present for Australopithecus Paranthropus. So just keep that in mind as you're looking at sources. So what distinguishes the robust Australopithecines? They have very small incisors and canines relative to the grassal forms, but much bigger molars. So they have a ton of dental and mandibular and cranial adaptations for a very specialized diet that appears to have involved a lot of chewing. Their teeth have very thick enamel. They have very large mandibles. They have sagittal crests, like a gorilla, which we don't see in the Australopithecines. 
They have very large flaring zygomatic arches. And remember, the zygomatic arch carries the muscle that attaches the jaw to the cranium. So it's your chewing muscle, essentially. And they have a large flat face, which probably carried uh, some of the stress from heavy chewing, right? So imagine if you clench your teeth all the time, that puts stress on your cheekbones, and you need heavier, flatter cheekbones to support that. So on the right there, we have the, the comparison of a of a Ethiopicus cranium and an Africanus cranium, and you can see that they're massively different. And again, if we put one of these individuals in a suit and put them on the street, they would immediately stand out because they would have this kind of pointed uh, muscly head and this large flat face, right? So clearly not a human being. So all these cranial adaptations together tell us that their diet was probably mostly leaves, nuts that you have to crack with your own jaw, and seeds, things that require a lot of chewing. And that implies that they had a mostly arboreal habitat, right? So they also have arboreal adaptations, especially in the arms, but even from the crania alone, we know they were living somewhere where a lot of plant food had to be available to them. They also have much more sexual dimorphism than the grass owl forms do. So remember that uh, afarensis, for instance, has some sexual dimorphism. Well, uh, the, the robust australopithecines have quite a bit more. And so in general, they're more like gorillas in terms of their behavior, probably, and their habitat and their physical capacity, and less like chimpanzees, which would be the comparison, the analogy for the grass owl australopithecines. And so what's interesting about these species is that the, then they all went extinct. Around one million years ago is when we see the last robust Australopithecine. And that happens to coincide with the time when uh, Central and Eastern Africa began to dry out and change from a forest to a savanna uh, and when the Sahara Desert began to appear. And so we probably think that these species probably you know, evolved the, the specialization so that they could... Uh, fit into a niche in forest environments. And when that forest environment went away, they were so heavily specialized that they weren't able to adapt uh, into something more generalized and they simply vanished. At the same time, the grass australopithecines were spreading out into the savanna and some of them were evolving uh, into something more like genus Homo. So we're gonna look at two species of robust australopithecines that you need to know. The first one is Australopithecus ethiopicus. It's found in Ethiopia. It existed two and a half million years ago and it's the earliest robust form. So that's the other thing is that these individuals, these species didn't evolve from some separate primate that was more gorilla-like. They evolved from the same ancestor, Ardipithecus ramidus, um, as the, the grass out australopithecines, their evolution just went in the direction of these uh, robust cranial adaptations. So again, it has a relatively small cranial capacity. You can see the post-orbital constriction, very small front teeth and very large molars and premolars. And you can see that the maxilla here is also very robust to hold those large molars. Huge zygom flaring zygomatic arch and most importantly, an extremely prominent sagittal crest. Right, so you can see that there's sagittal crest there. It's very clear, stands out, and there will be some cranial identifications on the exam. And so there'll probably be a, this picture or a similar picture focusing on the sagittal crest and asking you what kind of australopithecine this is. And you'll wanna use that sagittal crest to know that it is Australopithecus aethiopicus. The other robust Australopithecus you need to know is Australopithecus boisei. This species existed a little bit later, 2.3 to 1.2 million years ago. Their cranial capacity is much larger, around 510 cubic centimeters, but that might just be a product of the fact that they have a very large cranium, right? So again, gorilla, gorilla cranial capacity is fairly large, but that's just because they're pretty big. This is the outlier, the most robust species uh, within the robust Australopithecines, and 
that is present especially in the mandible, right? So look at that jaw compared to a human jaw. Look at the zygomatic arch and the cheek flares. These individuals, this species, had a huge uh, mandibular muscle, right? So their jaw would have been extremely robust. And they have a sagittal crest, but it's not as prominent as Boisei. And so from this large, uh, thick mandible, we think these individuals were chewing a lot, were cracking nuts and seeds a lot, less leaves than Aethiopicus because they don't have that huge sagittal crest to support those chewing muscles. Okay, so those are the Australopithecines, and then we transition into the genus Homo. So we're just going to cover the first individual in genus Homo today, and then next week we'll start up with the rest of genus Homo moving towards uh, modern humans. So the first member of genus Homo to be discovered is Homo habilis. That's just Latin for handyman, right? And the reason that that name was given was because uh, Homo habilis remains were found with older one tools before Australopithecus garhi was known to have used them. So it was thought of as the first human ancestor to use tools. They lived between 2.5 and 1.8 million years ago. And remember that here we're still only in Central and Eastern Africa. And their cranial capacity is quite a bit larger than the predecessors. So it's at 650 cubic centimeters, which is huge for an Australopithecine. Right? Remember that they're around 400 to 500, but it's tiny compared to us. So we're at 1300, our cranial capacity is twice as big. And these individuals are very small. So they were probably about half as tall as we were too. They had a very short stature, but they, had, they still had the long arms and hands of arboreal adaptation which we still retain to some extent, but they have an arched foot, which Australopithecines do not have. And they have a non-divergent hallux, which some of the Australopithecines do not have. And these are adaptations for bipedalism. So we don't know if they were habitual bipeds still, or if they were already becoming obligate bipeds. There's an argument for both. Some researchers argue that they probably lived in a, on the tree line and were partly arboreal. Some argue that they were probably living mostly in the savanna and were largely bipedal. We're not sure. They have much smaller teeth and a smaller mandible and a smaller zygomatic arch. And so their diet was more generalized than the Australopithecines. So again, their behavior is appearing to be something more like our behavior. And note how the cranium itself looks much more familiar, right, compared to an Australopithecus cranium with the relatively constricted uh, post-orbital area or a, a robust Australopithecus cranium with the massive zygomatic arches. This is something that kind of starts to look like a, like a Homo sapiens cranium. They appear to have had moderate sexual dimorphism, or there's an alternate theory, which is that they're actually two different species and that because the, that determination is made on uh, two groups of finds from widely separated areas. And remember again that there are just areas we've never looked, right, or have never found anything. But the finds that we do have are Homo habilis crania mostly in two different size classes. And so that has been argued to represent sexual dimorphism, but it's also been argued to represent a variation of Homo habilis that is just slightly larger. And the big marker for Homo habilis is that they have Oldowan tools and they have a lot of Oldowan tools. So with, with Australopithecus garhi, there are tools, but it's a small number of tools and flakes scattered around that are associated with the same layer as Australopithecus garhi remains. With Homo habilis, we have sites where there are lots of Homo habilis remains and there are hundreds of Oldowan tools, in some cases, thousands of Oldowan tools. So while Garhi may have been able to make tools and may have done so some of the time, it appears that Homo habilis made tools all the time and used them extensively, right? So 700,000 years of tool making results in a lot of garbage that gets deposited, which we find. And so this is the point in time where uh, human ancestor definitely used tools as part of their daily life to get food, um, which is something that we still do today, obviously. So it's a huge break point, even though Garhi may have also used tools.
Now, one thing I want you to keep in mind as we grow through these species is that this isn't a timeline where one species replaces another. Right? These species all overlapped, and evolution was happening at different rates in different areas, and the traits were evolving at different speeds, right? So remember, especially that arboreal adaptations stuck around for a long time. And so there was a time when many of these species probably coexisted, uh, at least in time, if not in space. And some of them probably coexisted in space as well, especially the robust and gracile Australopithecines. And that has been the case for most of human history, that there have been different members of genus Australopithecus and different members of genus Homo existing at the same time, and that the modern situation where we are the only survivors um, is very unique, and we'll look at why that might be at the end of next week. All right, that's the lecture for today. Your homework for this week is Lab 15. If you have the old lab manual, do exercises one through six. As usual, use the appendix. If you have the new lab manual, do exercises two, three, five, six, and seven. Again, use the material in the appendix. And I'll post uh, some links for study resources. There are some good 3D images out there. I'm not sure if we'll be able to access them in a convenient way, but I'll always try to post the links to the resources. Finally, I'll talk more about the exam next week, but it's going to be online through Canvas. If that, for any reason, would present a problem for you as far as being able to take it, uh, now's a good time to let me know. I'll put an announcement about that out as well. Um, there is a possibility to arrange some kind of alternate way to take the exam, but if you can take it on Canvas uh, on a computer, that's how we'll do it. I don't intend to introduce any complicated proctoring solution um, it's a relatively simple exam. I trust you. It will be straightforward. We'll just, we'll just take it. It'll be timed, but it'll be a relatively long amount of time. If you have any questions about that, contact me. I'll be talking about it more next week as I get it finalized. So thanks. Have a great evening, and I will see you all next week, which is our final lecture. The week after that, we'll have off as far as uh, lectures go. We'll have a review session or a review material available, rather. And then the semester will wrap up. I'll see you all next time. Thank you very much.